European quarterfinals is when those dreams of winning really start to take hold for fans and players alike. My name is Mark, let's talk rugby. The draw for the quarterfinals of the Champions Cup almost feels like the World Cup of last year revisited where we've got most of the favoured teams drawn against each other. But it does mean that we're going to have, you know, at least um, newer teams into the semi-finals this year. So it means it's going to shake things up a little bit. We're going to go down through each of the fixtures and talk just a little bit about them, not too much. And then we'll also actually uh, just quickly cover the Challenge Cup as well, because that's at the quarterfinal stages too. So we're going to start with Union uh, Bordeaux versus Harlequin. So Bordeaux, really a huge surprise package uh, this year. Oh, before I actually get into that, this one, it's uh, on Saturday. It's a three o'clock kickoff and it's at the Stade Chabon del Mar. And uh, let's see, so you can catch it on Super Sport, Flow Rugby, TNT Sports, BN Sports and France TV. So plenty of places to catch it. <coughs> Hopefully you've got access to one of those. Um, yeah, so it's Bordeaux versus Harlequin. So Bordeaux, yeah, a real surprise package this year. You know, you look at the talent in the, in the team and, you know, th- there's no surprise in that, you know, that it's such a talented team is doing so well. It's just that the fact that they don't really have a pedigree in Europe at all. It's kind of similar to, you know, Toulon, um, you know, a few years ago when the likes of Jolly Winkleton and stuff were there, that they they came with a really strong team and became a dominant force in Europe for a few years and then unfortunately faded away again kind of into you know, not obscurity, but certainly not uh, anywhere near the level that they used to be in European competitions. But Bordeaux, you know, they've earned their way here. They absolutely hockeyed um, Saracens for the second time, uh, beat them 45 to 12 at the weekend. And Saris didn't really even lay a glove on them in that game. And Bordeaux, so, um, so impressive as well. Like the, their two wingers, like Pinot and Biel Béry. You know, uh, both of them are just so dangerous, and you know, you've got to have a pack as well. The pack is decent, and then it's just that back line is just, just class all the way through it as well. So, you know, looking at them, and you're thinking that, you know, um, got to be the favourites for this game, right? Up against Quinns, who won their first knockout game, you know, uh, last time out against um who they beat who they they beat glasgow right uh let me just double check that whereas yeah they beat glasgow on the friday night 28 24 and you know like glasgow another team that haven't really delivered in this competition so it's a nice kind of you know again a mirror of of the world cup really like a lot of teams who weren't all that fancied coming into it but they're getting to play each other it means that one of them is going to progress um so Quinn's playing a Glasgow team who really haven't delivered at this level and they just about get through and now they're going up against Bordeaux who's a team that's just been knocking you know um European fa- favorites over for fun on their on their way to this stage again not maybe all that fancied in terms of you know a possibility of winning but I think whichever team it is that wins this quarter final once you get into the same final you have to take the team seriously then you know you can't just be thinking okay well that that's going to be an easy game for whoever whoever plays them because it very rarely you know uh turns out that way so you know bordeaux they did really well in the pool stages had a pretty easy uh quarter or round of 16 sorry against saracens and they're taking on the quinn's team who who definitely will be second favorites in this game but i think what quinn's have is just that ability to you know to have a go really that a lot of other teams maybe don't have that they're not afraid of 
uh, conceding tries because they have that belief that they can score two or three tries in you know if they get the chance in quick succession so they don't they don't necessarily feel like if they're like 15 or 20 points down that that it's all over they, they know that they can come up with those you know plays and get themselves a couple of tries and suddenly it's a one score game again so I think that's the, the one thing in Quinn's favor in this game is that they will have that you know a belief and the ability as well to, to back up that belief in terms of being able to score uh, tries in quick succession which means that you know Bordeaux they need to handle you know when Quinn's get a purple patch in the game which they will they, they their defense needs to be there as well it can't just be all about uh you know those backs being amazing on attack as well but i think if bordeaux play the way they did against um saracens i think they're still going to be too strong for queens and maybe got to win by you know uh maybe more than a score i think is going to be margin in this one honestly but again you know teams get to quarterfinals you can't automatically write them off either we we can have a what would you say like a good feeling about it or just looking at at the stats and stuff and think well this team is obviously better than that team but you know uh years and years of watching rugby uh tells you that <laughs> it doesn't always work out that way you know and we we generally get a surprise result um in a quarter final as well so maybe quinn's are going to be that team but for me if I have to pick one of them, it's going to be Bordeaux to go on to a semi-final where I think that they're going to be serious contenders then. You know, um, and people are going to have to start looking at them not just as this you know team that have done well to get to a semi-final, but contenders for the title because, you know, once you're into the semi-final, you're just one way, win away from that final where, you know, good performance and you lift the trophy right um on to the to the second quarter final then and like this is a repeat of the final of the last two years so it's Lencer versus stad uh la rochelle and it's on saturday 13th of april kickoff is 5 30 it's at the viva stadium in dublin uh, it's on rte b and sports tnt sports super sport and flow rugby so just got the two titans of this competition for the last two years la rochelle two times champions leinster two times run, runners up in the last couple of years only been you know um the slimmest of margins between them over that leinster obviously got a measure of revenge uh, by winning the pool game in la rochelle um this year but this is this is the one they want to win you know and i think la rochelle are the same they they wouldn't mind having lost that game against Leinster in the pool, if they then come on and, and beat them again uh, here. So, you know, looking at their, their quarterfinals, you know, we had, um, first of all, the Stormers versus La Rochelle. La Rochelle, 13 points and nil down. Um, Stormers then, you know, getting extra um, penalties well in, um, in the second half to eat out a little bit. La Rochelle start to come back and then then they get themselves ahead just at the right time in the game and then Stormers can't you know um can't quite come back because it was 22 points to 16 right Stormers score right at the death they then have the conversion to win the game but couldn't win it and that you know you have to give credit to La Rochelle's defense there because Stormers were you know, it was pretty obvious Stormers were trying to get in over near the posts and they couldn't do it. La Rochelle were pushing them back, pushing them back to the point where they decided, well, the crossfield kick is on. We go for the crossfield kick over in Hartzenberg. He scores in the corner, but then that makes the kick to win the game um, that mo- little bit more difficult. And in the end, it was just too difficult for them. So, you know, yeah, a kick, you know, a kick landing or not landing was the difference between La Rochelle getting through or not. But, you know, champions teams, um, more often than not, that kind of thing goes their way because, you know, I believe that, well, I don't really believe in luck. I believe that, you know, uh, teams put themselves in positions uh, to when you look at it in kind of a, 
uh, probability or statistical way that it's more likely for them to come out as the winners. I think that defense from La Rochelle at the end there is kind of a microcosm of that where they made it, you know, they made it so that Stormers, um, you know, had to, had to try and force that kick rather than potentially conceding under the post where Stormers just pop it over and it's done, right? So it's it's little things like that in games and, and also the fact that they were able to claw their way back into the game. Like a lot of other teams against the Stormers, you know, 13-0 down at half time. You're expecting then the Stormers open up a little bit in the second half and maybe get you know into the 30s in, in terms of points scored. But La Rochelle are really good at in second halves of, halves of games. They limit uh, the points that that the opposition score uh, and all the while they scoring themselves, clawing that, clawing back, clawing back, applying the pressure. You know, putting making it so that the the opposition they're almost not even thinking about scoring themselves they're just thinking about trying to handle this pressure that's coming from La Rochelle trying to defend trying to keep them out trying to you know maintain your line trying to keep them from from scoring the points that will get them ahead and then they go ahead and now you've got to respond and we saw that in this game we saw that last year as well in the final against Leinster where they did pretty much almost carbon copy right Leinster get a perfect start La Rochelle dig in they start working back working back working back denying Leinster those scores that we see Leinster normally getting to kill off games keeping the score low they get themselves ahead Leinster then um, you know coming back looking for that score that would win the game for them and then they pile on the pressure in defence Leinster end up giving away a penalty La Rochelle can clear and the game is done you know and those things don't happen by accident you know it's 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 just it's the mindset it's the preparation it's the the belief the will to win etc right all of that um the skill of the players the coaches the whole organization really um you know geared towards that and that's why you know i think they've been champions for two years in a row because they have that ability to just dig themselves out of holes that, that a lot of our teams can't. Uh, so that's the kind of mindset to coming into this game, you know, with also like Raj has, I think, pulled a master stroke by getting them to, um, you know, to, to go and train in Cork as well for the week because now he's got a lot of, you know, the Cork people on their side. Like, in fairness, you know, and it's for me, I don't understand it, right? It, well, I when I say I don't understand it, I mean that it's it's not the way that I think about things, right? Is that I've never been one to kind of begrudge or cheer against another Irish province, right? Um, for me, it's like Leinster are my number one. I cheer for them, okay? After that, then all the other Irish provinces. After that, then all the other URC teams. And that's my kind of hierarchy, right? Uh, in terms of who I cheer for. So I always back the teams that I feel that are there, you know, that have some kind of connection to me rather than I'm not really into big kind of rivalry type of stuff like that, you know, I mean, I know there are rivalries there, but it, it doesn't kind of float my boat as it were. I don't, I don't like to see, you know, Munster not doing well, or um, I don't like to see what's going on in Ulster where, you know, the whole province has completely imploded. Luckily now, they're, they're out beginning to come out the other side of that. I don't like the fact that Connacht are hugely inconsistent and must drive their, their fans crazy. I don't like the fact that, you know, uh, Munster were like kings of Europe and, you know, uh, an amazing, fantastic team. And then they had to sit on the sidelines when Leinster um, then took over that mantle and started winning, you know, everything around them. And then... Uh, but what I did enjoy was last year Munster winning the URC. And even though they beat Leinster on the way to the title, uh, you can bet your ass I was cheering for Munster in the final. So I don't, when I say I don't understand, I mean that it's not in my nature to be like that. But I do understand that other people it is in their nature. Some people, like my dad was kind of like that. He would get fun out of, um, 
not necessarily in rugby, but like he was more into kind of um, soccer and stuff. And he would he would love to see, you know, he was a Manchester United fan, so he'd love to see Liverpool not doing well or Arsenal or whoever you know the title rivals were um, not doing well. Um, so I can kind of from that perspective, I kind of understand it a little bit. Um, but I think Raj has has still pull off a masterstroke by going down to Cork, knowing that there are people like that who would want to cheer against Leinster anyway, and now they've got almost an excuse right, to say, well, Rog is here, he's a Cork man, um, and we've got you know, we've got now the, the La Rochelle team here, so we're hosting them, so of course we're going to have to cheer for them. You know, I think it's it's a masterstroke um, in, in that way, um, just just to get that, um, you know, feeling of, of not being in hostile territory, really, in the build-up to the game, you know, um, and also somewhere different for those players to be too. So I think in terms of the preparation for his team, I think it's going to be excellent for them. Um for Leinster, Leinster's preparation has to be excellent because we, we know from the last few times that these teams have played, Leinster have to be absolutely on it. We know it's not going to be, you know, um, whatever happens, it's not going to be a blowout to Leinster. They're going to have to work. There's going to be times in the game where La Rochelle are going to put that pressure on and do the same thing that they did to Stormers, do the same thing that they did to Leinster in the last two finals. They're going to be coming at them. They're going to be making it feel like, you know, Leinster are just defending all the time. And as soon as one tackle is done, you've tackled one behemoth, you've got to tackle the next guy. And then if you don't tackle him, well, then there's, you know, uh, there's another behemoth or there's a very skillful back waiting to get through that gap and score the points that are maybe going to condemn you to yet another defeat against, you know, th- this team that has been the bane of your life in this competition for the last two seasons and you know that's kind of really a great story i think uh in terms in terms of, of this and and as a leinster fan uh or taking myself out of being a leinster fan i can really see that um as being just an amazing thing that when we're gonna maybe look back on this period you know in years to come, that that rivalry there um, is going to be one of the main things of that. You know, you got two teams who um, just seem to rise above the others for the most part, at least in the last two seasons in this competition. And then when they come and clash against each other, it really is like a clash of the titans. But you know, we talked about La Rochelle in there around the 16. Let's talk about Leinster now, and they're, they're around the 16. So Leinster started really well against Leicester, although Leicester obviously got the first try. Leinster responded quickly to it. There was no kind of heads down. There was no real... He didn't feel like Leinster had to work their, bay, whack bay, or sorry, work their way back into the game. They just went through the process. They scored the tries, and they were ahead. And then we get into the second half then, and Leinster are looking comfortable, and then Leicester start to get a little bit of traction. And then we have that period where, you know, Leicester ha- have kind of got themselves back within a score, and, you know, uh, they, they're going, they, they know there's space out wide. They put the ball to the width, but they try and go there too quickly, and then Henshaw reads it, he intercepts, and he goes down the other end and scores, and that's pretty much the tie over. And that's how close it came for this turning into a nail biter, I think, for the rest of the game. And then Leinster then um you know went on from there and added some more scores and you know made it look a lot more comfortable than it was for periods. So and something to think about here as well is like, you know, Leicester did the kind of things that if you're going to beat Leinster, you have to do, but you, you can't just do it for, you know, a, a purple patch in the game. So things like attack them, like attack them at source, really, in terms of their attack. So you have to, like, pick your times to attack in the ruck because we know that Leinster like to keep players when they have the ball. They like to keep players in that 
attacking line to give more options, right? And more people for you to defend against. So attack then and get in there, turn balls over, win penalties. Uh, next then take away their set piece, put pressure on the scrum, put pressure on the line out, make it so that it's very difficult for them to attack off, off set piece because they're too worried about you uh, you know, taking the ball off them or conceding a penalty or whatever it is. Um, then the next thing is, you know, you've got to take your chances as well. You know, Leinster are so good at, you know, creating chances and putting them away. And you've got to be the same as well. You've got to be absolutely ruthless. You can't leave points out on the pitch because if you do, those could be the points that you lose by. And, you know, we saw it from Leicester for a period of the game, but we've seen it from La Rochelle for like larger periods of the game where they're able to do that against Leinster. And for Leinster, the thing now is that they know it's happened to them a couple of times against La Rochelle. It happened to them a little bit in this game too. What they need is, what I feel at least, is the ability that on the field to change things so that it doesn't have to come from the coaches where, you know, um, to recognize what's happening on the field, respond to it and correct some of the, of, of those, you know, things that are happening. So if La Rochelle are flooding more players into the breakdown, well, then you, you've got to be wise to that. You've got to have ball security there. You've got to have someone with their eye ready to go in and make sure that the ball is won and then, you know, if if your um, scrum having trouble in the scrum, then your players have to be able to listen to what the referee is saying about what's happening, not argue with him in terms of because every prop always, as far as I I can see, always feels like they're doing nothing wrong and it's the other guy's fault, right? But just to learn from that and give her a different picture to the referee and if that means that somebody has to get hooked if porter has to get taken off um you know maybe earlier than than was planned i think that has to happen um in order to, you know to give that that fresh picture also in the line out if, um you know if, if it feels like they're disrupting the line out too much then you got to find a new way of doing it whether that's uh you know going for for easier ball at the front or um, having a little bit more variation in there, so it's it's harder for them to to kind of you know work out what what the call is going to be, etc. Whatever it is, you, the players need to figure it out right, and the players are good enough to do it. It's just that they need to. They, it feels like like the you know the leadership at times can be lacking um, in games like this where they're under pressure because. If we look at the history for Lencer, like over the last few years, they're very actually rarely under pressure in games. You know, a lot of games they win very easily because they're so good. And, you know, so that handling of the pressure as well, um, I think is something that the players have to learn from. And obviously the coaches can instill it in the players, but the players have to put it into action. But I think, you know, this one is going to be, I, I can't because of how close it's been, the last few times that they played in the knockout stages, like well in the finals, obviously, um, of this competition, and how each of the, both those games have basically followed the same script, that you know Leinster have to be able to change that script, and that means, you know, uh, we've seen you know Leinster do un Leinster like things, it'd be like leaving points out on the field when. In other games, they would have taken them, like whether it's getting held up over the line, knocking on the ball, close to the line, giving away penalties when they're when they're at the, the attacking team, etc. Uh, you know, they they've got to get those things right against La Rochelle and not let the pressure get to them. I think that's what it is. It's you know delivering under pressure, and you know Lencer are normally really good at that, but against La Rochelle. La Rochelle are able to put them on, under more pressure than really any other team. So it's a new thing for some of these players to have to handle, you know, when that happens, or it's at least a rare thing for them to have to have to handle. But it you know, it's a it's a really is a fascinating tie and 
again, it's not just because I'm a Leinster fan. It's the time I'm looking forward to most because, again, it's like the, the finalists in the last two years playing each other in the quarterfinal. There's the whole thing of can Leinster do it against them in in the knockout? Can La Rochelle, you know, knock them out um, for a third season on the trot? Can they do it back to back in Dublin as well? Um, you know, in knockout game, can they then go on to win three in a row, which, you know, has has not happened very often at all in this competition, you know, and there's so much on the line here. And then when you think about it as well from a Leinster point of view, if Leinster were to lose, not to lose, if they were to lose uh, this game at the weekend, um, then where did they go from here? You know, then there's big question marks about about, about Leinster like that. If if they fail against the same op- opposition in you know two finals in a row and then a quarter final as well, um, and maybe in the same in the same way, then where what happens to Leinster? Like how how are they going to change themselves? And and that's not something that we're used to seeing with Leinster. Everybody's kind of from the outside looking in with jealous eyes at Leinster for the most part. Right, I know. I know they have knee neighbor in there, so the defense is going to be different than it was. Um, you know, last year defense is more bedded in as well than the, the time when they played in the pool stages as well. So there is that factor as well, and they will evolve and change even into next season. Whatever happens in this game, but it's still you know a hugely interesting uh, game, and I'm. It's one of these ones as well. It's so difficult to pick a winner, but. I'm a Leinster fan, so I'm going to go for Leinster by a score. And I think this time Leinster are, you know, they're going to come up with the goods and they're going to deliver in that final quarter, which is where I think they've lacked so much against um, against La Rochelle in, in the past two finals is being able to deliver and score points in the, in the final quarter, you know, uh, and outscore their opposition. I think finally they're going to do it in this one and they're going to go through. Okay, so we spent a lot of time talking about that one. So let's move on to the next one. I won't spend as much time on the other ones because I don't have as much invested in them, honestly. But really, still really interesting games coming up. So we've got Northampton Saints versus Watercombe Bulls. So Saints, you know, they're um, first in the Premiership versus Bulls, who are third in the URC. So two teams having, you know, fairly decent seasons. Um, I think both of them have... Uh, lost four, yeah, both have lost four times in their respective leagues. So, you know, the, um, their, their records are fairly similar in that respect, you know, um, uh, even though Northampton top of their, of their league, um, but you know, the Bulls have, have been going really well, all like, and consistently too, all through the league. You know, we've seen, um, we've seen recently, you know, Stormers starting to climb the league getting a bit of form. We saw the Lions as well doing something similar, maybe not to the extent of the Stormers. And we've seen the Sharks now also um, climbing off the foot of the table and moving up. But all year, the one South African team who have been delivering have been the Bulls. And, you know, they, they yes, they, they lost, you know, a, um, fairly easily against Leinster. Um, you know, the last time out in the URC, but uh, you, you can't really, uh, you know, mark that against them, I think, because you have to look o- at them over the entire season. Now, um, if we look, we'll just look at the, at the round of 16s and we'll come back, we'll kind of hold that thought and we'll come back to it. So um, we start with the Bulls. So the Bulls, 59-19 against the Lions. And they look comfortable all the way through. And what I love about the Bulls is that is 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 games like this because the Bulls, for my mind, have two styles of play. Right, they have one where they kind of get tunnel vision and they almost just keep it in the forwards. And for some teams, they can just absolutely destroy them, roll over them, and score tons of tries doing that. Um, but they can get unstuck when they forget they have a back line. But the other style of play is when the forwards are doing their thing, 
they're pulverizing people and uh, linking up with the backs. And we see that, the, you know, the skills that the forwards have in terms of being able to link out up with what is, again, a very skillful back line that they have there. And like, the, you know, they got threats at wide threats in midfield and, you know, it, it means that if, if the whole is working together, that it lifts the bulls up to another level. And that's what they're going to have to bring, I think, against Northampton. If, if, if they just do the whole thing of, you know, keeping it, because I've seen them lots of times where they're, they're camped on an opposition line and the forwards have it in their mind that they're going to drive over and they're going to score. And at the same time, you're looking at it on the TV and you can see like they're maybe in the right-hand corner, like camped on the line and over in the left-hand corner, you've got pretty much their entire back line not being marked because the opposition are piling everybody in uh, to, you know, to, to try and, and keep them from, from driving over. And then it just takes that, you know, um, presence of mind and somebody say, no, the ball's got to go wide send the ball wide and they get over and they score but a lot of the time i've seen them especially last year they get tunnel vision and it doesn't happen so i'm hoping that against northampton that we see you know um that ability to kind of you know yes batter your way um because there's nothing wrong with you know a big guy running over somebody um in a rugby game but also use those subtle skills, link up with the backs, have that presence of mind to see where the space is and go for the space and, and get over that way, right? Um, so I think they're going to have to bring that. They've done really well uh, to progress. You know, now last year they got to round 16 and they didn't really deliver in the knockout game. This year they did well in the pools. They got a home round of 16 game. Wasn't a hugely... Um, a, disappointed honestly in how many fans that were there but the game was on like you know in the in the midday sun in the middle of summer uh, which for my mind was just stupid right this should have been an evening game um so that you would get more fans there and i think as the seasons go by we're going to see more fans anyway for these champion cups game games because the likes of the bulls and the stormers they're going to keep getting to the knockout stages and they're going to get a little bit further and then they're going to build up rivalries and then fans are really going to get into it and and, and feel what the competition is all about right um but they're now going to northampton who as i said are, are you know top of the premiership they are um also you coming on to, into this on pretty decent form themselves in the champions cup you know for for years now northampton have been like you know almost like a has been in terms of this competition right they used to be good in kind of the rounds that would have been around like around the time they were they were in the final um against lencer i think when lencer won the first one right and lencer came back against them um i think that was maybe the last time that they that they had and a decent run i might be misremembering but it feels like you know at least 10 years since i've had a decent run in the competition but they used to be like one of the behemoths from the english game in this competition so they're looking to get back to that level again it may not happen this year but this year then can be a stepping stone for them to do that and you know in in their round of 16 we had like one of those blasts in the past Northampton Saints versus Munster used to be an absolutely mega huge um, affair back in the day, right? When the likes of O'Connell, O'Gara, Stringer, etc. were in that Munster team and Northampton were like, you know, the, the, you know, big enemy for them. We had the miracle match, etc. Right. Um, So those two were huge rivals, but Northampton this year, they went to Thorn Park and they pulled out a win over there when Munster fell away in the second half. And in this one, um, you know, it was 14 all at halftime. Munster winning 14 7 in the first half. Um, and then Northampton got over uh, before the break. And in the second half, then they start to pull away. Now, Munster did have issues, injury list, 
um, sickness in the camp, etc. But I still feel that even with you know a, um, a full strength monster, I think Northampton this year probably had that little bit too much for them um, in this competition. Now it would have been a hell of a lot closer, but I still think Northampton come through um, that game. So Northampton, you know, uh, coming into this on the back of you know um, a sterner test, I think for them in the round of 16 now we're going in against a bulls team who uh (laughs) like i'm i've seen posts about um how the bulls are going to get there and the fact that all all the squad is going to go and and so no one thinking this this has to be a joke it it has they can't be doing that but apparently they are like it's like flights here there and everywhere right Uh, to get everyone up and and for me it's just crazy like this for me, this should be the Bulls' biggest game of their season, and it should it should be treated like that by the whole organization. And 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 I don't just mean the Bulls; I mean the um, South African Rugby Union as well, right? That whatever has to happen to make sure that the team, you know, are are prepared well for this, it should be the same as like I haven't seen Chasing the Sun, but. Um, you know, I've, I've gleaned that, you know, a lot of kind of detail went into making sure that they won a second uh, World Cup on the bounce. And I'm thinking, like, where's that detail for the Bulls? Like, you know, get get this get this stuff right. Make sure that that team is, is there all together, you know, uh, in good time to have, to have a decent preparation for what, again, what should be their biggest game of their season you know it's a quarter final of a champions cup and you know again at the moment some bulls fans may not realize exactly what that is but the thing is with this competition is that every year only eight teams make it to to the quarterfinals right and four teams are going home and they've got to build for next season right and this is the first quarter final I'm hoping that they get there again next year, but the way this competition is, you could be waiting four or five years for the next quarterfinal. That's how this competition goes sometimes. And that's what I'm talk- talking about is that, you know, it's it's such a special thing to be able to make it to this stage of the competition. So with that in mind, you know, um, I want to see the Bulls do well, but I'm thinking preparation isn't ideal for them saints are in decent uh, form saints are at home and therefore i'm thinking it's going to be saints win i'm going to be cheering the hell out of it like for for the bulls and i hope i'm absolutely wrong but i think northampton um win this one and maybe we're going to see like the saints uh kind of pull away towards the end as maybe the, the you know the bulls fall off in the second half but I'm hoping it's going to be an epic one and that the Bulls actually come through and, and get a famous win because it would do, you know, I think it would do huge um, for the Bulls, huge for the Champions Cup in South Africa as well, and then just huge for the Champions Cup too to have a new team coming in there and, you know, bringing their brand of rugby and bringing their fandom into what is kind of a great what i feel is like a great tradition and a great family in terms of of this competition but honestly i think saints are going to win it but it could be it could be close um in the end but i think saints are just gonna have enough okay so the final one then we're gonna um talk about for this competition at least is toulouse versus exeter so again two semi-finals finalists from last year and again that's was talking about how it's, it's a little bit skewed in terms of how the quarterfinals were drawn so we're these are the two losing semi-finals for last year so one of them is going to return to the semi-final again um you know last year extra were like it felt like every round extra written off right against it was montpellier first i think and then extra almost lost they um scored right into debt to send it to um into extra time 
and then in extra time then they were losing and then they score right to death again to actually win the thing and and then all the way through up to that semi-final they you know they were hanging on in there and some really good performances from them as well and then they, they got to that semi-final and La Rochelle were just a little bit too good for them and it meant that you know what what was working for them against other teams just La Rochelle had an answer to it and that's the thing with La Rochelle for most you know, uh, teams, they, they've got an answer for them, other than actually to lose. To lose are kind of their kryptonite. Um, but, you know, Exeter, I think, did really well to get there. And then this year, um, you know, we knew last year it was kind of, it was built as kind of a last hurrah, right, for that squad because it's all going to be rebuilt. And everybody thought, well, they're rebuilding, so they're not even going to get out of the pool stages. And here they are in a quarterfinal. So, you know, you got to give kudos to them. And then Toulouse, Toulouse are just like a class team that can almost, you know, on autopilot glide to at least this stage in the competition. And then they, you know, they start going up through the gears. And, you know, especially I think in a game like this, you could see Toulouse really hitting a height. Um, but, but after that, it's about, when when they go against you know it's it's one of those weird ones right if they if they end up against Leinster then can they produce against Leinster? But let's talk about their um, quarterfinals first. So, um, or sorry, they're they're around the sixteen, not the quarterfinals. So the uh, Toulouse first thirty one seven against Racing. It was pretty easy for. For Toulouse, like Racing, I felt were actually lucky to get seven in the end. But Toulouse, yeah, um, you know, it's just just class in the forwards and backs as well. And and at times you just make they make rugby look easy. And like they got Dupont in there as well. Um, but you know, it, it, they don't they don't do, they don't even need him. Uh, although. <laughs> You're not going to say no, obviously, but I feel like they're just just class throughout their team, right? Um, and Racing are just not up to that level in this competition, you know. And again, you know, Racing they brought in Lancaster. They're going to bring in uh, Owen Farrell next year, etc., um, to try and get them up to that level. But Toulouse are similar to to Leinster, um, or they're even like a, I would say like obviously a step above Leinster in that they're able to to produce squads year on year on year on year that get to quarterfinals, get to semifinals, get to finals, win the competition five times. You know, that it's almost um it it, it, it in in terms of just the whole rugby club, it feels effortless, but it's because of the effort that goes on at the rugby club that makes it look effortless, if that, if that makes any sense. Um, and, and similar to Lencer in that, you know, the system that Lencer have uh, gives them the squad of players to choose from. That means that they're, they're going to have a good shout, right, at things. And then obviously coaches, etc., cetera, uh, playing style adds, adds to all of that as well. But yeah, Toulouse, um, fairly comfortable in that round of 16 win against Racing. And then Exeter, um, they were playing against Bath. So I thought Bath would probably beat them because Bath are, you know, um, in decent enough form. And then, yeah, if you think like of, of league form, so you got Toulouse are second in the top 14. And then Exeter are like in sixth place in the Premiership, but, uh, and Bath were second. So I was thinking, yeah, Bath will probably just have just too much, um, for extra in that, but no extra. Um, they they did really well in terms of you know um, make making sure that they were the ones that were ahead coming into that final stretch in the game. And you know maybe it's you know even though it's a new squad of players for the most part, maybe just even having that um, you know knowing that they were in the semi-final last year, whereas Bath, it's been a long, long time since Bath have gone, um, you know, anywhere really in in the Champions Cup. Like, it, you know, 
we're talking old, old, old Heineken Cup, the last time that the Bath really performed. Um, whereas Exeter, and it's one of those things, right, around a club or a province or, um, you know, a region or wherever teams get called. But having that um, kind of DNA, as it were, that kind of history of performing in this competition really helps and again i go back to the south african teams that's something that it's going to be built up over the next few years especially in the stormers and the bulls because they're the teams who have now you know twice gotten into knockout stages of this competition and you know it builds kind of a hunger uh to you know you get a taste of it and then you have a hunger for it and you want to perform and you you know you, you want to be the team that gets to, you know, the first semi-final or the first final or lifts the trophy for the first time for your club. If you don't achieve that, if you're the, like, let's say this Bulls team are the first to get to the quarterfinal, well then in, in future, then another team wants to be, to go beyond that, be the first to get to the semi-final, et cetera, et cetera. Right. Um, and I feel like with extra, that's what's happened to them over the last, kind of few years that they were a team that came from you know relatively nowhere in terms of they no history in the premiership they know history in europe but they've built that up and they're at the stage now where i feel like within their organization that there are still people around you know whether it's coaches or or players or ex-players or uh, kit men or just you know people around the club like working in admin or wherever the hell it is right um who have that um kind of knowledge who've been there and done that in terms of you know winning this competition etc um and and it really does i think help with a team but then you look at their opposition and you look at toulouse and and they're the ones who are the masters of that right they're five times champions more than anyone else um and they just always seem to deliver in this competition and because of that i i think if you split these two up into um other quarterfinals maybe they meet again in the semi-final right um but given that this is the matchup for this quarterfinal i gotta say it's going to be to lose i think exeter will maybe get closer than most people think um especially coming into that kind of final 10 or 15 minutes of the game but to lose just have you know they have so many ways of beating a team right they they've got the power to beat you up front they've got the backs to make you look silly uh they've got the like that transition on turnover ball to just absolutely turn turn a game on its head as well um, they got a, an amazing kicking game too. Like a lot of people don't kind of talk about that because of the other things that they have. But like, the, you know, the kicking game is decent as well. And yeah, I think they just got too many strings to their bows uh, or strings to their bows that were uh, for, for this extra team. And therefore I'm going for it to lose win in that one. Okay, so that is the um, Champions Cup. We're going to have just um, a much briefer look at the quarterfinals of the uh, Challenge Cup. So let me pull those fixtures up now. So quarterfinals, Gloucester versus Ospreys is the first one. It's on Friday. It's at 8 o'clock. It's in, in King's Home. And, you know, uh, Gloucester, the, the one remaining English team left in this competition um, against Ospreys, who had, you know, have done really well to get this far. And it's one of the, it's one of these ones. It's kind of like the Bulls, where I'm I'm going to be cheering for the URC team, but I'm expecting the Premiership team to win it. So I hope to be pleasantly surprised in that one. I'm backing a, a Gloucester win, but Ospreys um, and Ospreys fans, like um, kind of interacting with a few of them on uh, Twitter in, over the last week, and, and it's great. It's honestly great to see. Um, some Welsh region fans being happy and feeling that you know a confidence and having a pep in their step, etc. It's just so great. Um, and again, it just comes to that thing we we're talking about earlier is that 
you know, um, I I want I want everyone, all the URC teams to be uplifted. You know, I don't want to see uh, teams down the bottom who just get hockeyed all the time and can only beat each other. Um, I want to see competitive Welsh teams in the URC and in the European competition, and this is fantastic to see. I hope Ospreys win, but I think Gloucester, or Gloucester, sorry, um, will continue being the lone representative of the English going into that semi-final. Next, then we have um, Claremont of Aaron versus Ulster. So this one is on Saturday, thirteenth, uh, twelve thirty kickoff in the Stad uh, Marcel Michelin. It's on uh, TNT, Being Sport, France TV, Super Sport, and Flow Rugby, and you know, you're talking about you know, two teams who have seen better days in terms of European competition, if we, if we can put it that way. So Claremont, you know, they had that period where they were almost like every year contenders for the Heineken Cup, right? And they, they were so desperately wanted to get their hands on that trophy and it never came to be and now they've kind of fallen away a bit and it's kind of it's sad to see because i love teams especially french teams that take european competition seriously um because it's so refreshing really to see a team that that just says listen we've got we've got the slightest outside chance of qualifying for you know out of the pool stages we're actually going to send our first team away um, to play we're not going to do what other um you know french teams might do send you know guys who who haven't played all all season and and keep the you know the big boys home to prepare for the next top 14 game so i love clermont for that um and you know i, I wish that at some stage they do lift um you know they they, they get more silverware in europe they they lift this trophy or they lift the the champions cup at some stage because they absolutely deserve it just because of the way that you know the, the, the way they treat it and i think it would be very very special for them then we also got ulcer like ulcer the first irish team to win the champions cup back in 1999 um and since you know it's kind of since that time um we kind of struggled to really be a force in europe you know um they had a a couple of times where they went deep into the tournament, losing to to Leinster or whoever right along the way, um, and not able to re- to repeat the feat. And then now you know um, this year very poor start in the Champions Cup in the pools, and everybody kind of knew that they were out of that. And then they scraped their way then into into this competition, and you know. There's, you know, you just have to um, talk to anybody who's an Ulster fan or, or read any of the articles about what was happening up there this year. And, and you know the reasons for why why this season, at least, um, they, they, they dipped a lot, you know, because they're a team who the last few years have been, like, knocking on the door trying to win the URC. And it, it felt like they were getting closer and closer to closing that gap on the likes of Leinster um, and the Stormers, etc., right? But they'd never produce when it came to knockout stages. Then um, last year, they had a huge, massive blip um, where the, the form went off a cliff. And then this this year, this season, then even worse, right? And it ended up with, you know, uh, Dan McFarlane left, the CEO, or I think it's the CEO, right, has left as well. Um they now got Richie Murphy in there, um, Ireland under twenty under twenties um, coach. You know who's um, you know uh, coached him to second place in the six under twenty six snakes in this year. Won the Grand Slam with them last year as well. He's in there as interim coach, but most people are expecting that he's going to be kind of long term coach in there as well. So they've got a little bit of bounce from that, and it got them through. Um, you know that that. Uh, round of 16 last week uh, where they, they did really well to come back but I'm wondering now is this maybe a step too far for them at you know I don't feel like he's lo- there long enough to have the impact to prepare them again 
to go away to France again and produce a back to back. It feels like still this Ulster team are a team that can perform in kind of fits and starts rather than consistently. So because of that, I'm backing uh, a Claremont. Well, I'm I'm going to say Claremont are going to win, um, but again, um, I'm an Irish man um, and a URC fan. I'm I'm cheering Ulster um, in that one. Okay, on to the next one then. Sharks versus Edinburgh. So Sharks bottom of the table almost like up until the la- only the last couple of rounds of the URC, right? And but then their stats are telling you this team is not bad. Like, you know, they're like line outs going really well. Um you know, scrum's not bad. Their defense is decent as well. It you know, it kind of beggar belief why why are they not performing, right? Um so they're taking on Edinburgh then, a team who last year and is unfortunately beginning to, to happen a little bit this year to them but not so much but last year you know they took off like a rocket um first half of the season then second half just fell away now at the minute um you know in the urc they've dropped down to ninth place now in the urc and what two two three rounds ago they were they were in fourth place looking like potentially you know, uh, trying to push their way up into the top three. So that's how much they've kind of fallen over the last few rounds of the URC. Whereas, as I said, the Sharks, they were rock bottom of the table. They've now climbed their way up to 13th. So they've, they've gone past Zebra, Dragons and Scarlets, you know, in, in that period. And now they're setting their sights to try and hunt down Cardiff um, ahead of them. So... You know, two teams who, if you just look at league position, you think it's ninth versus 13th. Edinburgh should have enough to win this. But if you look at recent form, it goes the other way, right? Sharks are on the up. They've been performing well. Uh, good performances and good results. Um, Edinburgh, kind of the, the other the other way, right? Uh, performances haven't been as good and the results haven't come for them because of that. And because of that and the fact that this is, you know, uh, in Kings Park, I'm going to back the Sharks to win this one. Okay, so the final quarterfinal then is uh, on Sunday. It's 12.30. It's in the Stad uh, Monigo. It's on uh, EPC Rugby TV, B and Sports, TNT Sports, Super Sport and Flow Rugby. It's Benetton versus Connacht. So, Another all URC tie in this one, and it means given this one and the Sharks versus Edinburgh, we're guaranteed, you know, to have two URC teams through to the semi final at least. Um, and kind of looking at the league table again, Benetton in sixth place, Connacht down in tenth place, but there's only three points between them, right? Benetton, though. Another team who started the season really well and they were up there like uh, towards the top top of the league. Uh, you know, only lost maybe one one or two games or something. They were kind of at the same level as Leinster other than they weren't picking up bonus points, right? But up there in the top two or three for a lot of the season, then they drop away a bit. They drop outside the playoff places and now recently they've rediscovered a little bit of form and worked their way back up to sixth place. Connacht have been kind of a yo-yo team. You know, um, they fell out of the uh, playoff places, worked their way back in, and then they've fallen back out again. You know, and and that's the problem with them at the moment is there's no consistency in terms of their performance, and it feels like they've you know um, it's hard after Connacht have produced a good performance, then the next week for it almost seems like it's harder for them to to go again and to do it again. And you know, looking at that that crazy uh round of sixteen game against Pau where it looked like they were dead and buried and then they just resurrect, you know, come back for the dead and they they get themselves um uh, over to to win the game. 
it, you know, that feels like that's going to be their kind of peak in this competition. And it's going to be, I think, um, a Benetton winning this one. I think Benetton have been the more consistent team um, of the two. And I think in in this case, I think consistency is going to, um, you know, trump Connacht's kind of unpredictability that can mean that they're amazing or they're, they're terrible, right? And, and I'm not just talking about from game to game. I'm talking about within the same game. Um, we've seen it so often this season. But yeah, I think Benetton are going to win. But again, going to be cheering for Connacht. But it's one of these ones, right? It's URC versus URC. So URC is going to come out on top one way or the other. But I'd just rather that it was the, you know, um, the um, Galway green, as it were, um, of Connacht rather than the, the green of Benetton that, that, that went through. But um Again, I think another interesting game. It's it's one. Unfortunately, I'm going to be working at the weekend, so I'm, I'm looking at all these games look, kicking off at twelve thirty. I'm thinking, why? Why? That means I can't watch any of them. Like the only game I can I can catch um, of the of the champ or Challenge Cup is um, the Gloucester versus Salisbury's game, right? To catch live, and then. In the Champions Cup, I'm a little bit lucky, or luckier, should I say, um, if I look at those. So the Bordeaux Quinns one, I won't be able to catch because it kicks off basically as I, as I um, will be finishing work. So by the time I get home, um, the game's going to be pretty much over. But Leinster, La Rochelle, um, I can watch that. Northampton Bulls, I can watch that as well. Um, and then Toulouse, Exeter again. Same deal, it's going to be over by the time I get home, but at least I can catch you know three of the eight games. Whereas last weekend I watched um seven of the eight games in Champions Cup and then the, the Connacht game as well. So for so I got to watch eight games and got a little bit spoiled. Um, so three games this weekend, I'm just gonna to have to, to, to do with it right. But that is the end of uh this one, as always, like a kind of prattle on. For, for probably too long for some people but um you know i just love my rugby and i love talking about it and if i had somebody else here to chat with i'd probably go on for another few hours but we're going to cut it there and we will be back with reviews of the games that i can catch live and then we'll do reviews like a catch-up of the champions cup and challenge cup action from the weekend on probably uh monday as well so uh just a question over to you then quarterfinals what are your predictions and you know in terms of if your team is involved in there what do you think they're going to succeed or what do you think they're they're going to fail <laughs>